One particular family we spoke to, they themselves believed that they could be the Tanner sighting. The most pivotal events on the timeline was Jane Tanner's sighting of a man carrying a child. One particular family we spoke to, they themselves believed that they could be the Tanner sighting. Hello and welcome to True Crime Rocket Science, the most authentic voice in true crime. Exactly a year ago today, on April the 30th, I caught a flight to Amsterdam and arrived in Amsterdam um, on the 1st and then on the 1st I flew to Praia de Luz. Uh, when I got to the airport I hired a car and I arrived at Praia, in Praia de Luz uh, quite late on May the 1st, 2019. In this episode, which is part two of the three-part, three-episode review of the disappearance of Madeleine McCann on Netflix, episode eight, we're going to be looking at um, kind of the Johnny English level of investigation, which is really only hinted at in the final episode. I do think the investigation into Madeleine McCann deserves to be ridiculed. I do think the investigation deserves to be mocked and um, treated with disdain just because of the ridiculous things that happened. You know, it is presented as a very professional um, high profile case and yet what actually happened is ridiculous. I'm not saying what happened to Madeline is ridiculous and I'm not saying that anyone shouldn't be um, serious about investigating it. I'm saying the actual investigation was a mess and what I'm saying is the the only thing with the McCann case that was professional was the public relations. On March 26, 2019, about a month before I left for Portugal, uh, I wrote a blog post, Operation Johnny English, and it was based on the Netflix documentary, the middle section of episode eight. And that is the ambit of what we're going to be talking about in this episode. If you're interested in the next episode and also an in situ investigation on scene, so obviously after I've concluded the review of the final episode we're going to go on the ground and look at some of the things that I found when I was in private Luge kind of in real time so I'm going to try to on the day that I was in a certain place deal with it with the photos and so on I'm going to try and do that um, corresponding to a year ago okay so if you're interested in that kind of analysis please uh, subscribe to this channel like, share, share on Reddit, share on the forums that might be interested in this sort of thing. And let's get started. So it should be noted that the Netflix documentary came out in March 2019, so around about this time last year. And one of the things I asked in the previous episode was why? What is the point of the Netflix documentary? And part of the point is to say, well, who was behind it? And what narrative was it perpetuating and for what and towards what? And I'm speculating, but it does seem to be interesting that at the same time that the McCanns were appealing to the European Court of Human Rights, uh, it was an attempt to silence the Portuguese ex-police chief who claimed their daughter is dead and that they are responsible. At the same time that they were appealing this, this Netflix documentary came out. And while the McCann said it had nothing to do with them, it very much presented their case. Um, and their case was that the Portuguese police were unfair, that there was definitely a paedophile abductor running around and um, all the various scenarios that presented the, um, the case for the McCanns, ultimately culminating in there's hope. There's hope that Madeline's still alive. There's hope that we'll get her back. We, we will never give up hope and that uh, in hope is a virtue. 
And that whole hope narrative is something that I'm going to be looking at in the very last episode in the series. My point is, at the same time that the McCanns were involved in a legal appeal, this uh, Netflix thing came out, which reinforced that exact same narrative. Um, in I'm, I'm talking about if you put all the episodes together... It boils down to kind of an appeal to the abduction narrative, the paedophile abduction narrative, which is what the um, McCanns have kind of been suggesting in some form or another all along anyway, either an abduction or a paedophile abduction, um, either directly or through some of their spokespeople. What I really love about um, the middle section of the last episode is that it finally concedes the absolute joke of the investigation and the absolute joke of the key star witness in terms of the McCann case. So episode 8, the, the latter half of it at least, saves the best of the McCann's 12-year investigation while it's now 13 years for last. In the final episode, we are praised of a giant leap, and I put this in, in italics in the original post, a giant leap forward in a lengthy and expensive search for Madeleine McCann. So you, you have this years and years going by where um, lots of the public's money is being spent on this supposed um, no stone unturned search. There's this very professional search for Madeleine, right? And, and then after five years, they realize, oh no, oh no, we made a huge mistake. The Tannerman sighting was a mistake. We've been searching for something that was a mistake. Um, oh, oh, oh no, um, how, did, how did we make that mistake? Um, but hold on, making the mistake in the first place made complete sense. It made complete sense that they investigated a mistake for five years. It made complete sense. I mean, uh, Jane Tanner saw this, this, this person and he was carrying a child. I mean, that was a legitimate witness account. That was the, 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 one of the biggest insights into what happened to Madeline. A man was seen walking away from the McCann's apartment in the dark. Doesn't that mean Madeline was abducted? And what I <laughs> think is so funny in that um, quote of, I think it's a guy called Andy Redwood, he talks about one of the things that we picked up very quickly. He's saying, you know, they examined the McCann case and one of the things I picked up really quickly was that there was a night crash and um, it was operating from the main Ocean Club reception and eight families had the 11 children there and one particular family we spoke to they themselves believed they could be the Tanner siding. R really did, did they believe that after five years or did they believe that right in the beginning when people were saying I saw this guy walking around and, and there's a picture of him and there's a picture of his clothing and all that kind of thing. And that guy who was Dr. Julian Totman came forward right in the beginning. And this is the joke. Despite him coming forward, the police continued to investigate the Tannen Man sighting as though it was legitimate. So so someone was saying, who is this guy? Who, who could be the abductor? And the guy who was also a doctor put up his hand and said, hey, it's me. That was me carrying a child. Hello, it was me. Almost trying to imagine this guy doing star star jumps and kind of, you know, almost like donkey in Shrek, like jumping, saying, it's me, it's me. And the police saying, well, who could it be? Who could it be? And him saying, it's me, it's me, it's me. And just refusing to uh, acknowledge Dr. Totman for five years. And then uh, Andy Redwood says, you know, very quickly, very quickly we realized that... Um, we, that, that there was a night crash and um, one particular family we spoke to, they themselves believed they could be the Tanner sighting. Well, what about you? Didn't you believe that these people could be from the, the Tanner sighting? The other part that is ridiculous about this is you have eight families that left 11 children at a night crash. So the Ocean Club had a night crash if only um, people used it, and some people did use it, but other people didn't use it. Other people, plural. The Tapas 9 didn't use the night crash. 
other people did use the night crèche, but they, in their wisdom, believed that it wasn't necessary. They would uh, they would eat separately from the children and just leave them in their respective hotel rooms. And so if you think I'm being unfair or if you think I'm being sarcastic and if you think I'm being satirical, and I am to an extent, I mean the title of the blog post and the picture of Johnny English is geared to satire. Um, you had headlines like, why did Maddy cops waste years on sighting of GP? And it should really be, why did Maddy cops waste years on um, bogus sighting of GP? That, that should really be the headline. And another question is, didn't they know? I mean, why did it take them five years with the doctor coming forward to click? You know, were they unintentionally wasting time on a bogus sighting? Was it unintentional or was it something else? So let's give them the benefit of the doubt and say it was a case of mistaken identity that Dr. Julian Totman closely resembled Jerry McCann and in fact played tennis with him on the day Madeline disappeared. His daughter went to the same crash as Madeline as well. So this guy that actually abducted Madeline, I'm talking about in this bogus scenario, in other words Tannerman, he actually closely resembled Jerry. If you look at pictures of Dr. Julian Totman, he looks almost like a more congenial version of Jerry, the same kind of hairstyle, the same somewhat slight build, maybe slightly taller. In any event, despite the enormous epiphany, another rather glaring aspect was that Dr. Totman couldn't have been walking away from the McCann's apartment after nine o'clock at night while carrying his sleeping daughter, as Jane Tanner claimed, because he had to walk across the road, east, right, from left to right of the road, east, to the crèche to collect her. So when, let me just be specific about this, when Dr. Totman, Tanner Man, went from, from the side of the road that was the McCann's apartment, to the other side of the road towards the crèche, he couldn't have been carrying his child before dinner because he would already dropped his child off. So when he went to fetch his child, he couldn't have been carrying a child. When he returned, uh, and he was staying in the hotel obviously, when he returned from the crèche he was carrying the child. Which direction, um, which direction was he walking after nine o'clock when he was carrying the child? In other words, he wouldn't have been carrying his child to the crèche at 9 o'clock at night. Bear in mind that um, Jerry sat down for dinner at 9 o'clock at night that night. But this guy who let, let his daughter go to the crèche wouldn't have um, had dinner that late. In an article published in the Daily Mail on the 7th of May 2018, so around about two years ago, um, Julian Totman said he was carrying his daughter back from a crash when he was seen by one of the so-called Tapa 7. So I've circled that in the article, is that he's carrying his daughter back from the crash. Now what does that mean? It means that he went to the crash, collected his daughter and returned, and that was when he was seen. But let me just be clear there. If he's carrying her back from the crash, then he's going back to the Ocean Club, which means he's going from the right side of the road to the left side of the road. So how could Jane Tanner see him walking from left to right when he was walking from right to left? And I'll tell you why it's a problem. It's a problem if she saw him walking from right to left because then Madeline's abductor is actually carrying Madeline into or towards the apartment. That's not going to work. How can someone abducting Madeline, Madeline be carrying her towards where she stays? In that same article they say, Despite Mr. Totman telling police about his movements, detectives on the Olgov continue to hunt for the so-called Tanner Man, named after Jane Tanner, the woman who saw him that evening. What I love about this article is they say, um, Detectives on the Olgov, which, which kind of implies it's the Portuguese 
police that fixated, that made this massive boo-boo, the detectives on the Algarve, uh, wasn't it the British police that also focused on Tanner Man, that actually focused on Tanner Man? The same article describes Jane Tanner as a key witness who saw this dark-haired man, this faceless dark-haired man, carrying a child, wearing pink floral pajamas and so on. But it was only an hour later when she was told that Madeline had gone that Miss Tanner realized it could have been the abductor. Really? So it could have been the abductor walking towards the McCann's apartment. And she didn't recognize this guy from the group that stayed in the hotel with him. So this was something that I highlighted in the blog post is why is Jane, why is Tanner Man sketched walking across the road, across the street while carrying his daughter to the right? In the sketch is moving to the right. Why? And also, why isn't this even brought up? Why isn't this fact, this obvious, logical, supremely um, clear fact, why isn't it brought up anywhere in the eight-part documentary series? Curiously, in a follow-up sketch, so it's another Tanner Manish character is brought into being. So basically, Tanner Man has now been debunked. Okay, so well, let's just get somebody else in. Let's let's just uh, find another Tanner Man, and that's exactly what happens. Um, another Tanner Manish character is brought into being, and this one is walking the other way. Oh, that's great! Now he's walking the right way, um, but uh, alas, he's not carrying anyone. Shucks! I guess one can't get everything right in these investigations, but one can sort of waggle it at the media anyway, right? Is it mentioned anywhere in the documentary where Dr. Totman was staying in the hotel? I mean, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe he didn't walk back to the hotel. He was just using the creche, right? Does, does, do they say anything about him, you know, what his room number was relative to the McCanns? No. Nah. Why would anyone want to start contextualizing the crime scene and reenact where the actual people were hypothetically? Why? Well, it may have solved the Dr. Totman debacle in the first hours of the investigation rather than after several years. That's why. And the answer is we know where the Totmans did stay. They stayed in block G4M, which was the block neighboring where the McCanns stayed. So, so the McCanns were in apartment 5A. 5 was the name of the block, block 5. A was um, the, I guess, the number of the apartment. It was actually GA, but it, so for the ground floor. In terms of the um, Dr. Totman's apartment, that was block four, and then it was the ground floor, and then apartment number M, and that was in the block next to to the west of the block that the McCanns were staying in, and the apartments were sort of in the kind of in the middle between the um, east easternmost um, apartments and the westernmost uh, apartments on the ground floor, so kind of in the middle. And uh, what is quite interesting with the with Dr. Totman's apartment is it's very hard to find. You're not easily going to find online if you Google it. You're not easily going to find a graphic showing exactly where he was staying, which I find quite interesting. The other thing that I think is worth noting is um, the McCanns released an artist sketch of Tanner Man in October 2007. So one month after they were declared suspects and one month after they left Portugal, they suddenly had the sketch of Tanner Man and um, suddenly the investigation kind of took a whole new lease on life, didn't it? And one can kind of imagine a scenario where, can you imagine if you are a tenor man? Can you imagine if people are saying, this is the abductor of our child, this is what he was wearing, blah, 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 and then you realize it's you. With the enormous, the colossal media coverage, are you going to want to put up your hand, you being the person that is directed at, but knowing that it's, it's you and that, that it's not not legitimate, are you going to want to put your hand up within all of this, um, fu furore the circus and say hey uh, it's actually me you've made a mistake and and that is the damage that um, 
massive PR like this does, which is people who are good people and sincere people and who, and who want to help and who are honest are actually going to be also afraid to come forward because they don't want to be part of this media circus. And in a way, this deafening cacophony of media actually um, prevents those from coming forward that, that, that would have otherwise. And if you didn't have this cacophony, um, you, you have far, far fewer leads coming through and, and far less of a deafening sort of chorus of bogus sightings anyway. You've got the whole pub, pu public that are galvanized into action. You know, if you see anyone, any child that, that looks suspicious, it could be Madeline. So people all around the world are calling in their Madeline sightings and virtually all of them are bogus. And that's the situation you get with this massive PR. The same thing happened in the Nora Corrin case, and I wrote a book about that, where Nora disappeared, and then they thought the best way to get her back is for the whole world, not just Malaysia, people all over the world to find out about Nora and to have public fundraising and to get people from outside Malaysia to go and look for her. That's not the best way to look for somebody. The best way to look for somebody is to look for somebody where they went missing. And that is where Nora was ultimately found, like something like half a mile to a mile from where she was last seen. And, and the Corrins wanted uh, everyone to go far afield looking for an abductor. Maybe it was a pedophile abductor. Meanwhile, she, had, she was just around the corner. And if everyone had just searched in a systematic way from the last point that she was seen, instead of looking for a pedophile abductor, a kidnapper, maybe they would have found her. And the, um, the interesting thing with the Madeleine McCann case is it's heralded as the gold standard for how to investigate a missing child case. You've got this case heralded as the gold standard, the most professional way to successfully investigate a missing persons case. And guess what? They failed. They spent a shitload of money and haven't found anything. And yet they claim to be the experts, the success stories, and this is the way to do it. Well, no wonder they failed at finding Nora Corrin. Something else that was absolutely ridiculous in that last episode was you have the retired FBI sketch artists, and you have so many retired FBI people in these documentaries. And um, talking about... You know, the, the, the spark that, that the sketch artist has got to recreate is in the face of the abductor. That's really the area where a good sketch artist must excel. And then, oh, by the way, there just was no face. And that is where you actually have um, the sort of mind fuckery of the series where instead of dwelling on the news that the sketch artist was actually accurate, just irrelevant in, in everything except the face. The irrelevant accuracy is oohed and odd of as, as though the, the sketch artist was actually really an amazing person and, and that the whole Tanner Man thing was actually a triumph. You know, the magic of the sketch artist um, sketching the wrong person um, just w wasn't that amazing, you know in effect justifying the cops and media and everyone else wasting a fuckload of money and shitloads of time. But the way it's presented is, is this great success, this tremendous, this tremendously accurate sketch of a man without a face heading the wrong way. And instead of any contrition, instead of any genuine apology, any, any regret, um, there's this sort of self-congratulation of I naturally hope that my drawing would lead the lovely McCanns to their daughter really because ultimately what it did is it misled everybody and there's this sort of self-flattering um, thing of it's uncannily similar to Julian Totman <laughs> that's not something to be proud of it's something to howl and be in tears about spending all these resources for nothing, wasting time for nothing. And you know, you have this interesting narrative where the McCanns say, you know what, um, the police took an hour to arrive. 
the police took three hours to seal the international borders, that they should have closed all the airports. There should have been a lockdown, basically. Because we don't know where our child is, we should have locked down Portugal, maybe locked down the whole of Europe, maybe locked down the world, and, and that way we would have found Madeline, right? But um, instead of instead of that, and instead of being having any any um, legitimate um, grievance against the sketch that is that sent people the wrong way for five years, it's fine. Look what a nice sketch it was of Julian Totman. That's why I say it puts into perspective just how ridiculous the whole thing is, the, the whole sort of legitimate investigation, the whole, all of the legitimate, le legitimate grievances, you know, the winds that the cops arrived half an hour or more too late to the crime scene. You know, if you're going to arrive half an hour too late, uh, what difference does that make if your star witness is giving false information that's going to lead to, or uh, inaccurate information or misleading information that is going to lead the investigate the entire investigation astray for five years. So, the follow-up investigation that was supposedly on the right track, not investigating the McCanns, wasted years on a bogus lead. But that's not a big deal. The sketch, at least, was accurate. We should also compare apples with apples. The man who the cops were looking for, the imputed abductor, turned out to be a father abducting his own child. Let me just say that again. The man who the cops were looking for, the imputed abductor, Julian Totman, this guy who was thought to be the abductor of Madeleine McCann, turned out to be a father who was abducting his own child. And for years no one saw that. So why would it be egregious to merely suppose one of the M McCanns may have done the same thing? Why would it be so strange to say, well, ma what, couldn't one of the parents of Madeline have been carrying her at some point in the night. Did anyone see that? Or was anyone else carrying Madeline? Couldn't it have just been a parent that was mistaken for someone carrying the daughter? Couldn't it have been the own parent carrying their own daughter? Is that such a crazy thing to imagine? Another aspect which we'll deal with in more detail in a moment is why would you use an expert artist for the Tanner Man and subsequent sketches and then when you progress to another suspect and this is referring to Smithman supposedly the key sighting so in other words you've gone now you said Tanner Man's not going to work let's now deal with the other man Smithman but when you progress to him wh why wouldn't you use the same artist or, or why wouldn't you have a, um, a, a whole spiel about how accurate those sketches were w w why are you focusing on the brilliant sketch of the wrong man of the wrong the, the wrong sketch why are you focusing on the brilliant art artistry in the sketch that turned out to be useless i think the part to uh, emphasize yeah, is the same thing that i mentioned earlier where we say what is this whole netflix documentary in aid of was it meant to was it just somebody who was interested in the McCanns or was there some larger objective given the legal process that was underway at that time and which we still don't know the result of I mean that result if if it if the appeal started in 2017 it's a four-year process so the result of it the verdict is supposed to come out next year and this Netflix documentary came out slab bang in the middle of that process. In the same way, are we saying that this, in other words, that the documentary was just completely innocent, it didn't have anything to do with the McCanns, it was just somebody who, who felt like making a documentary about the McCanns, right? Is it the same thing with the Tanner Man sighting? It was just an innocent mistake, um, also the police investigating it despite Dr. Totman coming forward, it was just another innocent mistake. It had nothing to do with um, the McCanns. It was just a error. And the police continuing to investigate it was also just a police mistake. So it was Jane Tanner's mistake. It was also the police's mistake. And the McCanns didn't notice the problem either. I mean, they're both doctors, very intelligent people, and the top of seven are also doctors. 
they didn't notice the mistake either. None of them sort of put up their hands and said, couldn't it have been that other doctor, Dr. Totman? None of them made that error either. The error ended up coming from um, not even Dr. Totman waving and saying, it's me, it's me, it's me. It didn't even come from that. It came from a brand new investigation where if, where, where um, Andy Redwood kind of said, oh, look here. Yeah. Very quickly we noticed that, that, that this was a mistake. Oh, okay, that's how it came about. So, I mean, this was incredible police work, the kind of thing I don't think even Johnny English would be culpable of. And um, and then episode eight, we see that by excluding Tannerman, everything changes. Oh, that's amazing. So if you take Tannerman away, what changes? Oh, now the timeline shifts forward and we face with a different and rather Irish kettle of fish. I mentioned in the review of episode one that the timeline is covered in the docuseries in a voiceover that lasts about as long as it would take to read this paragraph. Now, with, with a few minutes remaining in the final episode, now it's time to examine the timeline again. So, very, very clever. So, in the first episode, you set up the false timeline. Bear in mind that this information is coming right at the end. You set up the false timeline knowing it's the false timeline and then you pretend to investigate that through the course of seven episodes. By the time you get to the eighth episode, you said, oh, we've got brand new information. Everything is going to change. Um, this is the, the breakthrough that's happening in the updated re-looking at the McCann case in 2019, right? Except that this Tanner Man thing happened in 2007, October 2007. And they knew that it was bogus that same year as well. So when one looks at uh, Operation Grange, or indeed the entire investigation into Madeline's abduction or disappearance, it's difficult not to see the whole sad spiel as something other than a tragic comedy starring the Pink Panther as the recast Portuguese police, minus Senor Amaral and Johnny English confidently leading Operation Bungle. As millions upon millions are spent in the fruitless search for Madeline using public money, an incredible amount of nothing happens. Could it be this suspect? How about that one? Oh wait, maybe it's the Podesta brothers. And the soundtrack to this shit show, there is always hope. The mother of that child never gave up hope. Elizabeth, keep the faith. Keep hope alive. We have hope. Rebellions are built on hope. 